how they always say you are addressed the way you dress or looking good is good business, all of that. Well, clothing is one of the basic needs of man. It's just right there on Maslow's hierarchy when it comes to shelter, feeding and clothing. It is basic. But then you find people who take it up a notch. They add so much vibrance, beauty to that simple clothing. And this morning on the show, we're talking fashion with someone who's been described as one of the forerunners of the fashion industry in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us live on the morning brief is High Chief, you have to put that, <laughs> High Chief Zizi Cardo, veteran fashion designer. Good morning, welcome to the good morning. Good morning, Bruce. good morning. I didn't want to commit any offense, so I had to put the High Chief. Oh my goodness. And I know we were bantering about that before we started. Why yeah. High Chief? How did, no, how it just, did that come? I mean, it's a title, like you would have a chief, you have yeah. the High Chief. And so, High Chief, Chief, whatever, you know. <laughs> so, um, the High Chief, I understand you're also a doctor. Yeah, honorary. Honorary doctor. So the high chief, just by the way, for a lot of people who don't, who don't mm. understand, it means that you have a, a chieftaincy title. Yeah. And then another chieftaincy title. So yeah. it's double chief. Yeah. So where are they from? The, the, um, chieftaincy titles? the high chief is from my um, constituency, my local government is Kwato, yeah. local government, which is in Abia State, Nigeria. And um, the title is Adeja Gamba. Uh, which is like uh, an ambassador right. for the people, a daughter that we can, you know, send out. Mm -hmm. And then the um, chief itself is from my village proper, which is um, called Umobiela in Isikwato. And um, it is um, Chinyelugo of that? Obialugo. Obialugo is our kind of like autonomous name. Yeah. And then the Chinyelugo is like... Um, a beautiful eagle, you know, that is given to us and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, it is just my people saying, you know, um, I think the whole thing came about when I had an event at celebrating my, I think, 10th anniversary at the Eco Hotel. And I had one of my fathers, a, a king that came for the event. And he was like, oh, well, I didn't know we had a daughter who is doing us proud. And um, so he wrote back to the... Um, elders and um, yeah. Hi, Chief. We, <laughs> Says Ricardo. we know we don't play Thank with our chiefs and titles in this part of the world. Yeah. But let's talk about what you do. You've yes. been described by mm -hmm. some as one of the forerunners of mm -hmm. the fashion industry in Nigeria. You say that you don't just create for the Nigerian fashion mm -hmm. space, you mm -hmm. create with the international market in mind. Yeah. But walk us through. Uh, how this all started for you. Why fashion? You're beautiful, absolutely. Thank you. So uh, did that come naturally? I'm beautiful, I'll do fashion naturally. Or you had to really learn this? Um, it was something, I've always been into the fashion um, business, but on a different, on a more industrial um, um, scale. Yeah. Um, I used to do um, uniforms for companies like Halliburton, Mescline, Coastal Service, um, um, a lot of all these um, shipping lines and um, um, oil companies. Were you doing it from here? I was doing it here, and I was doing also. I was also servicing restaurants and stuff like that. So um, yes, I've, I've always been doing fashion in that aspect. But I thought to do something a bit more, um, a bit more, because I love the African fabric, as it were. I love the local fabrics. I love all the things that we do with the local fabrics, which is like the. Um, Ashoke, Akwete, Kurukurubite, whatever it is that we have, Akwacha, all of those. And so I was designing for myself and eventually I thought, um, I think for me the um, um, highlight of it or the, the, would I say the aha moment for me was I traveled to, um, was it Senegal, um, Ivory Coast once right. and I saw this wooden shop and I so loved the vibrancy of the fabrics. I love the patterns. I love the motifs and all of that. And I was like, you know, I could do a lot, a lot with this. And so I bought quite a lot of it and I came back and I started the, then it was just the ethnic. And because I, I, I had this vision that we could do a lot. We could kind of like create and identify ourselves as Nigerians first and then as Africans. Because you look at the K 
Kenyan, the Maasai, you look at the uh, Niger people with their boo-boos and the Senegalese thing that they wear, you look at so many other African countries, they, can, they have an, a kind of identity, even a Ghanaian, you see him with his kente wrap, you, you have an identity. But as at that time, which was about uh, 20, 1999, 2000 and stuff, we're much more into the Western um, fabrics, Western clothing and all of that. A lot of people do the boutiques and if there was anything that was then was people buying a lot of laces. And my dream was, you know what, I need to, I need to create a kind of identity for us as Nigerians. And so the need, I started creating stuff for the Ankara and every other African fabric. And of course, um, initially it was difficult. I keep saying this. And um, for the first one year, I sold just the one outfit because people thought I was going bonkers. How could you make anything out of the Ankara? Ankara, of course, then, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, was seen as a poor man's fabric. Ooh. I mean, if you understand any of you growing up, you would know then that it was just the market woman that would have the you know, the wrapper, or if a woman gives birth, it's given to her to use as, mm. you know, covers for the baby or to tie the baby, you know, behind and all of that. But I saw potential in it simply because I feel we can create an identity with it. And so I started doing that with all kinds of um, fabrics that we had. And I think when I realized I was onto something was, um, I got into a competition then with the Nigerian Fashion Show organized by um, uh, Lexi. And then um, I won the competition for Design of the Year because I again used all the fabrics, interpreting my co um, ideas or interpretations from my cultural background and all of that. And um, yeah, we won the competition and we had an all expense paid trip to I think it was Milan or something, or France, I can't remember. And so that was the beginning of me taking our fabrics or whatever it is that is ours and taking it outside. And since then, it's been so, so, something I do. So walk, impressive. Uh, so walk us through how you reimagine things uh, when it comes to fabrics because mm. uh, the show is all about a learning curve for yeah. young people as yeah, well yeah. who may be watching you who may have heard of mm. you may never heard of may, may never have heard of you but just are inspired to say okay uh, whatever she's doing i think i can yeah so help us uh, walk through that process of your your thought process i should say mm. of how you imagine fabric and reposition it for these victories that you've recorded? Um, well, first and foremost, um, my interpretations are, is, has always been coming from my cultural background. And as an Igbo person, um, I, I try to, um, how would I say, interpret it and produce it to the point that it is more global, it is more appealing, not just to us. Um, and so I, I look at pieces that, um, let, let's, let me take my, my background as an evil person. We have, as a young maiden, let's say you want to get married, and you have what you would call the atupere, which is what we wear in the then, and then you have a little piece of cloth on your waist, on your boobs area, and you have a little thing around your waist area. And sometimes you find is lots of pieces of fabrics that are put together to, um, make that little skirt or just have a little wrap around it. And so in my interpretation of stuff like that, to make it appealing for the Western or everybody else, I kind of like play with the one sleeve. Or so you find a lot of my pieces are kind of asymmetrical. They're not always all together because um, I see, rather than have this little bits, 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 which really is our culture if we look at it, I try to add elements of, um, so it becomes kind of like cosmopolitan. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's contemporary, it's easy for everybody else. So it's not just, oh, this is just African and you have just a fabric staring at you. I try, I, I now do the a fusion of what you call the Western and the um, African 
fabric put together. So I try not to make it too heavy. It's light. And you find, I would say, quite a lot of my clients are based internationally. Uh, the expatriates, the whatever, because it's easier when you have pieces not so. Sometimes our colors can be quite overwhelming, and so I break it down in that in that aspect that it is not just about this one particular fabric or this one particular um, cultural. Um, uh, would I say, uh, interpretation of uh, the, uh, the design. So I make it where it's more interesting, where it's more globally appealing, where anybody and everybody can wear it wherever you are. I mean, instance, the last um, event we did, yeah. we, we, I, I, I called it um, ethnic fluidity especially mm -hmm. for the men's... Um, I like uh, the name. Ethnic fluidity. <laughs> Sounds nice. Yeah. It might like flow like water or whatever. Yeah, so you find um, that was me trying to kind of do a kind of unification uh, in terms of, or, or would I say diversity and inclusion thing in terms of um, bringing all the ethnic groups together. And so you find pieces that has um, a, an element of the Yoruba um, Buba and Shokoto has the Ijoman's um, wrapper and black, um, shirt, has all the elements. You have the, uh, um, the house's Baba and Riga elements as well. Do you well. have the picture because I, I'm... <laughs> I know bits and pieces. I, I can imagine them separately. I'm trying to imagine. Yeah, them so we mesh them all together, and so you find this, you know, asymmetric-looking outfit that has um, the embroidery that has to do with the northerners, that has the buttons to do with the ijoma, and that so, and it has a wrapper. That ha you know, to do with the, um, also the Delta and the Igbo people. So we kind of like married all of this. So this is me reimagining Beautiful. and... <laughs> just speaks to uh, that unity and oneness that we yes. always talk about. Yes. Th there was a time, I'm not saying there was time, recently people were asking, where is the Zicado? Because mm. for those who knew the fashion industry 10, 20 years yes, ago. Yes, yes. I mean, you, who knows the Zicado? <laughs> I mean, who are you? I mean, where are you coming from? But we've seen younger, uh, you know, fashion designers coming up, you know, also doing great things. Absolutely. And, and I wonder, how do you feel seeing them? Do you feel like, okay, been there, done that? And do, do you feel there's a, there's a lot of competition in that space? Or for you, you sort of carved your niche and you're now what they call Baban Sale? <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel for um, you seeing the younger ones come up and doing great things as well? Um, to be honest, I feel it's, I don't feel pressured in any way. And uh, I think to answer the first question, um, where have I been? I have been busy parenting to Beautiful. start with. Um, my daughter lives abroad and so for a bit of a spell, I ha had to, you know, be with her. Uh, make sure things are okay in that department. Anywho, so <laughs> um, yes, um, looking at what's happening now in the in the space that we have as a fashion in um, uh, space, it's exciting, it's beautiful, um, and I think it's yes, it's high time. Um, I remember when I was um, when I first started. I, I, quite a few people tell me you were two decades ahead of yourself. Because as at that time, it was so difficult for people to understand what I was trying to project or the dream or the vision that I had in mind. And I remember people coming into my shop space then and going, how could you think Ankara could be a, for any... I mean, why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your resources? You could have a proper a boutique like everybody else and you know bring in things why are you doing this to yourself this is given to me as an advice and but i held on to that dream because i knew there was potential yeah. in what we have as a nation to what we can produce you know and i stuck to it and look at it now the whole world is Ankara, the whole world is Africa, the whole world is really looking into because there's a lot of talents in here. There's a lot of potential. And so I'm, I'm quite excited now when I see young people truly in that space expressing themselves. 
visual, you know, putting on canvas. Because as a designer, the, the runway is actually your canvas. That's the only place where you can express yourself. And back then, it was difficult for people to understand that this is what it is. That the runway is a canvas where you can let go, you can let loose, you can reimagine, you can reinterpret, you can do whatever you want. And so they find it difficult to understand that, hey, you know what, if I do this avant-garde thing on the runway don't mean that I can't do anything normal. And so you find people back then that will say, oh, I thought you only do Ankara and you don't do anything else. And I'm like, but it's the same machine, it's the same season. Right. But now we have come to understand that, you know what, this is really what fashion is all about. It's business, it's fun, it's... Um, is a lifestyle and for people now the young ones being allowed to express themselves with any um, um, uh, restrictions it's really amazing and i'm so happy and, and glad for a lot of them <laughs> so, so there's a tax in my head i'm trying yeah. to uh, put forward to you i don't know whether you're solving it already or you will take it up which has to do with people embracing their figure uh, without necessarily trying to choose to go under the needle. We've seen issues around BBL mm. and all of these things. And that is because of issues around perhaps, mm. I may be wrong, self-esteem. Mm. How can fashion help people to embrace themselves even further? Uh, I see that sometimes there is accentuation and all of those things, but how broadly can fashion help people to just be comfortable in their own skin? Mm. Um, I think um, if you look at the trend as it were now, and the buzzword that is going about, I've been, it's all about diversity and inclusion. And you see now a lot of the runways, not just the skinny models anymore. There's some people who have gone even further as to put um, models on wheelchair on the runway. So, um, and the last show I did as well, I had um, uh, men who were, some of them were sons, some of you know, golfers, they, they, they were executives in different um, um, fields that, you know, oil, whatever, they were executives in that area. And they were part of the models. And it's the same thing all around the world. People are beginning to understand that, hey, there needs to be this embrace. And I, for one, over the years, I've never subscribed to skinny models over the years. And so when I do my shows, even if it's internationally, they always know. I always use models minimum of size 10, 10, 12. Because there's a lot of um, issues that come up with sticking to skinny models. You have bulimia, you have anorexia, you have drug use, you have all sorts of things involved just for them to stay that skinny. You know, and so I, I, I saw that a long time ago. And in my little way, I have been using, even here in Nigeria, a lot of the bigger models know that I never used the skinny one. So I think fashion is really now understanding that fact that we've done a lot of damage, not only on our carbon footprint, on the, um, uh, on the global market. Yeah. So there's a lot of damage that the fashion industry had done. So people are now beginning to learn how to write things. And globally, there's a, a shift in the kind of um, models that are being used on the runway. Fantastic. And I think that's uh, great to see yeah. uh, that we're championing all of that. There's, there's a lot of conversation around that. Maybe we won't get deeper into it. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, yeah. uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but there's always been that um, debate around how much um, fashion designers charge for outfits. Mm. Again, is that a good thing to get into this morning? No, let's get not? into it this morning. So, um, we'll just have like two, one, two, three, <laughs> so let's change and, and then we'll run out. Right? <laughs> so, uh, they wonder, uh, why, why is it that expensive? Uh, is this just something for clout, just to hype your status. I mean, I saw someone who won your dress recently. I was like, I won the Zicado's dress in a raffle. I'm excited because I can imagine how much it costs. Uh, so speak to us about that debate around the costs, uh, mm. how much you charge, particularly in this kind of economy. Mm. Uh, well, um where would I start with that? No. Okay, no, the do thing you still is charge this. 10 million and above? No, 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 no. That For me, that is ridiculous. Mm. That is absolutely ridiculous. I, I mean, you guys were talking about um, the state of situations, the price, inflation, all those kind of things, dollar, all that. You, you were talking about it this morning. And 
um, unfortunately, a lot of us thrive in situations where we take advantage of one another, regardless of what situation it is. And so, yes, we, we do know that um, the fashion industry is money intensive. Yeah. For you to actually make any kind of headway, you need to have you know, some serious markup because you're paying for uh, your space, you're paying like Workers, people like, yes, yes, I run generator every single day because there's never light. So, so and you cannot tell your client, you know, I can't. I wish you can repeat that for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, unintended. No, right? but it's true. <laughs> you run your gen every single day, 24, I mean, almost 24 hours a day. And you can't tell a client that, hey, you know what, there was no uh, um, power, so you can't mm -hmm. have their clothes um, right. done on time. And so you have to do that. But still, you know, um, I do believe that a lot of times when people come up with this, oh, you know, the outfit is made for two million naira, one million, most times it's just for clout. People want, to, and it's unfortunate that we as Nigerians oftentimes relate with things like that. We feel that if it's not expensive, then it's not worth it. It's not, you, we have this elitist mentality. Right. Mm. You know, the more... <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> so, uh, this is not the end of this conversation by any means, she absolutely. Did you notice that she never told us the range of how... But she's <laughs> giving us an insight. That she's giving us But you know insight, where to find that. Uh, Hi, Chief Zizi Kado. The thing is, we can go on and on with yes, you, really. Because yes. there's so much mm. knowledge, so much wisdom and experience with you. But thank you so much for your thank time. You. We'll thank you. We'll be speaking you. with veteran fashion designer. You have to put the high chief. <laughs> Double chief. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. You guys us are morning, funny. Brief. Thank you. Thank you, you. So Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <sighs> so there you go. That's the show for today. But we're back tomorrow. Hopefully Bukala joins us. She's up for it. But I'm Kairo Kikyolu. Make sure to have a great day. Don't forget, Sunrise Daily is up next. And Bukala, get well soon. We'll be back here tomorrow by the grace of God to do what we love to do. I'm Jeffrey Zama. Bye-bye. <laughs>